Um, am I speaking loudly enough? Okay, uh, so this is uh, about a year ago, I started making this uh, exhibition and I had this idea to create uh, something that referenced a historical event that the British were involved in, which was the, uh, the burning of the Summer Palace in China. And uh, the English translation of Yuan Ming Yuan is uh, the Garden of Perfect Brightness. And so there's this kind of ironic sort of uh, take on what is brightness in this respect. So these sculptures that you see here uh, are all based on the Chinese scholars' rocks, otherwise known as spirit stones. They're kind of microcosms between, uh, of, of landscapes, meditative focal points between nature and civilization. But here they've been made with uh, Financial Times newspaper. And for me, they're a reference to the digital spaces that we all exist in now, but using motifs of nature to reflect upon the contemporary landscapes that we all exist in. And um, they're kind of revered, you know, for, um, you know, the, especially the ones with these holes. And the way that they've been created is uh, naturally, that is, the natural stones, is uh, the limestone uh, within deposits within these stones would erode with, uh, uh, with the, sometimes they've been put into the river to, to erode these sorts of uh, spaces. So they create these kind of meditative sort of uh, focal points, these kind of portals into these other sort of uh, uh, conscious spaces. And so they occupy these, uh, uh, the, obviously the, the physical space, uh, the floor space in the exhibition, and they stand on these 3D printed uh, clouds, and um, they're made uh, uh, in the uh, interlocking sort of sections. And so you've got this idea of these mountains popping through these sorts of clouds or these mists, uh, as if, in a way, uh, we're in a kind of heavenly sort of space. And then that reflects back into the paintings themselves. So what you have are these four landscape paintings, and each of the upper sections are actually uh, manipulated so the imagery from the scroll, the imperial album uh, of the emperor uh, of the 40 views of Yuan Ming Yuan, uh, of the gardens themselves. And this, uh, uh, this imperial album is currently in possession by the French. And um, so when uh, they invaded uh, China in the Second Opium War uh, in order to open up trade to be able to uh, trade uh, opium and to have more favorable trade terms. Um, they spent uh, three days burning down and looting the, the palace, uh, the size of which was equivalent to uh, Central Park uh, of New York. Um, so even some of the people, the diaries of some of the soldiers you know, we're saying that the beauty in this garden, uh, it soars the heart uh, to be destroying it. So I'm paraphrasing, yeah, but it was along those sorts of lines. And uh, so I was reflecting upon, you know, these sorts of narratives, and they hover over the modern uh, cityscapes of China. So you have here the top four cities, uh, the top four earning GDP cities of uh, China. So you've got the, the past, looking at the past, into uh, looking uh, into the future. So despite this kind of traumatic event, you know, this economic miracle has still occurred. And the entirety of the exhibition is really about meditating on these sorts of narratives, these histories, you know, that these are otherwise sometimes invisible, because of course history is written by victors. And then in the, uh, the center of the uh, space of the still life uh, painting that you see uh, at the end over there is um, it's a painting based on Dutch still life painting. So Dutch still life painting 370 years ago during the Dutch golden age is considered to be the birth of modern capitalism uh, with the rise of the East India Trade Company and also the first recorded uh, economic bubble over the speculation of tulips. And so they were trading these tulips, at the peak of which they were selling for the price of a house before they finally collapsed. And uh, so I'm always looking at these kind of um, uh, histories of economics 
And uh, when I first started using the Financial Times as a material in my work, I was interested in using a material that I felt you know, was uh, a metaphor of the, of the digital spaces that we're all in. And so from 1940 to 98, I was at art school, and what was happening around me was the rise of the internet and the availability of mobile phone technology, which changed the perception of you know, our realities uh, into a state of constant flux. So time and space became almost instant. You know, this idea of being able to, for example, just calling to the other side of the world was no longer this long process of very expensive sort of phone call, et cetera, and so on. And um, so all of, all of these new sort of disruptive technologies are particular moments in history that I'm interested in that mark a moment in our humanities. And so the, the concept you know, of like providing a garden to comp contemplate you know, these sorts of histories, you know, these uh, notions of beauty, poetry, and uh, 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 hidden narratives, if you like. And so the windows are also made from the Financial Times and bamboo. And uh, for me, they, all, they represent homes. And so the home being a kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, ultimate symbol of, um, of a human space. You know? But here, of course, they're, they're also uh, sort of implying a kind of walled garden with these sorts of uh, windows and, of course, these uh, paintings that are views onto types of landscapes. And here, uh, even these sculptures themselves that are these kind of mountains sort of rising through the mist, sort of inviting you to think of yourself in a kind of heavenly sort of space, you know, to, to once again also, you know, think of uh, perhaps standing like a figure in a sublime painting, you know, sort of um, uh, contemplating, you know, kind of existential questions about uh, uh, our past, present, and future. So, for, so the color palettes, for example, here of the landscape paintings, they're kind of like a science fiction-like sort of uh, color, color uh, range. And uh, so, once again, looking, you know, from uh, ancient sort of uh, narratives through to sort of uh, uh, a kind of a cyberpunk sort of uh, world, this uh, neon landscape through which we all occupy. And, uh, but I've rendered sort of like these uh, images from the Imperial album, you know, of uh, some of the remaining images of the Yuanming, uh, Yuan Ming um, uh, Yuan Garden, uh, what it used to look like, because obviously it's all destroyed now. But in this kind of almost like an aurora sort of like form. So an aurora, of course, is a, uh, is a, a spectacle of how the Earth's atmosphere is protecting us, you know, from the solar rays. So once again, another motif to do with uh, uh, heaven and uh, Earth. These kind of archetypes of like uh, the way how we tell human stories, you know, to unite, you know, us into groups, you know, into tribes, societies, civilizations, nations, you know, and uh, these multiple stories, these histories that are often written by victors are what are used to bind us you know, into uh, a form of collective identity through which our leaderships can then choose to mobilize us in certain directions. And um, these kind of romantic narratives are prevailing, for example, in the still life paintings of the Dutch Golden Age, you know, which are romantically about the transience of, uh, of life and uh, the the futility of materialism in a Puritan, because there were Puritans uh, uh, in that period of time. And also, of course, the, the fragility of mortality. But what they, but you know, humans being humans, they wanted to show off and they had enormous trading power. And so that genre of art was also about displaying some of those things, some of those objects that they would be able to accrue through the power of uh, their nation and what they did. Um, to, to gather through their trade, powerful trading routes. And, um, but art has a way of erasing, perhaps, you know, some of the uh, uh, histories of how they accrued such an enormous amount of wealth. So, of course, uh, slavery, colonization, militarized trade routes, 
The East India Trade Company, still in today's terms, would be one of the most powerful companies in the world. And they had an army of 250,000 soldiers. Uh, so, you know, those sorts, of, uh, those sorts of histories and narratives, you know, uh, that are often shrouded in a more romantic narrative are some of the things that I'm very interested in identifying in order to understand our own human condition you know, on a global scale through the different histories all the way through to modernity and uh, in order to think about who and what we might want to become.